So I'm going to uh, discuss how it is that we can at the same time have um, what you might say intelligent design and yet not the first order kind, which is what Nassim Taleb points to. And also another thing that I agree with Taleb, which is uh, that high IQ is not equivalent to intelligence, uh, whereas it is equivalent to something akin to speed. And that's something that uh, perhaps Taleb and I might disagree with, uh, that there is anything at all valuable there being measured. Uh, what is being measured is actually more akin to uh, low viscosity. If we're using metaphor, we're always using metaphors, right? We're using language, and language is merely a set of pointers. Everything is a pointer. All experiences are pointers. Uh, so you can never stop the metaphor. Uh, the goal is to reduce the degree of metaphor as much as possible. Uh, but you need then you need to abstract in order to move. And that's the magic that a lot of people don't understand is you need the metaphor in order to move. Without the metaphor, so if you can't detect complexity at higher levels, you get stuck at the object level where you believe in the discrete unit, which was a metaphor all along. Uh, and that's, that's a mistake. So the processing uh, for any given prediction, any given perception, is relativistic, as I said in my other video. So these things already happened. So by the time that you experience anything, it has already been edited. The movie has already been edited from the entire multiverse. So most people have this idea that you are a brain in a particular society. You are a brain in Western industrialized society. <laughs> But actually, you are the sa the samples of all possible experiences are not remembered. And that's what it feels like to be this, is to not be remembered. And since I don't remember having been everything else, having been everything else that I actually am, that's what allows me to be new while yet eternal. That was my, the deepest paradox possible, uh, which is what I have, what I was trying to understand through those videos that I was making. You could see the same uh, sort of recurring pattern is that's where my mind was going to is, how can I be time and yet eternal? How can I be separate and yet the same? it seems like that's impossible. And, and that's beautiful because we discovered relativity from the inside of mind. So we discovered our own eternity by not believing in eternity. So naturally you don't have a sense of time. Naturally, it's a complete opposite. You just feel eternal. And then you develop the sense of time. And then by being very precise and very mechanical, atheistic, in your observation of discrete units, you develop laws of physics, of understanding that are predictive. And these then lead you to understand that you are actually eternal. Because there, it, it turns out that it wasn't Newtonian because of time dilation. So it's a loop that recognizes its own eternity in complex ways. And that's how a blue peacock works. So the blue peacock, uh, the, the way that it survives is through the handicap principle. The only way it can survive is by taking on a larger load than its enemies, who are the camoed peacocks. So natural selection is a filter for for the cowards and for those that take on too much of a cross. So the blue peacock has to carry what the female actually wants, which is the fitness, while at the same time giving her beauty as opposed to just hiding. Because 
you indicate that you have higher fitness if you could get away from the tigers while being blue and having this huge, enormous uh, tail. Uh, this seems extraneous. This was Darwin's mystery, right? How natural selection wouldn't predict that. Natural selection would predict uh, you are just going to get more and more camoed peacocks uh, that are just trying to hide better and better or, or fly away better and better, escape from tigers better and better. But no, it has to... It has to sort of say, hey, hey, here I am, tiger. I'm offering myself to you in order to offer myself to her. And that's a beauty. And then that actually creates the perception of beauty in the network. We're like, I detect the beauty, and I'm not even a peacock, right? Like, that looks far better than some brown fowl bird. And... People imagine that all of these things are epiphenomenal. Like, like everything that you observe is somehow not connected, <laughs> as if that was possible, right? Like, for instance, in the AGI discussions, artificial general intelligence, people talk about uh, the alignment problem, and they don't understand that you have to actually have a belief in death in order to submit to a hierarchy. Mind is hierarchical, and it doesn't cooperate in the prisoner's dilemma if it doesn't believe that it's a prisoner. So, you need a belief in death. A belief in death is not some random quirk of the human, the arbitrary human. Nothing is arbitrary. The human is the center. It is the center of creation, of its own creation, and... The Copernican principle is, is a strategy. It's like you have to believe in the randomness. You have to believe in the random distribution in order to become better. And that's how you fashion a diamond from the coal, is you believe in the random distribution. You, you believe, I am just this arbitrary thing, and that's the self-sacrifice. That's the handicap principle. That's You're crucifying yourself by actually believing that you're not important. And and that's what we did. That is science. Like, we believe we're not important, and that allows you to become better. That allows you to outcompete the people who thought they were important. Uh, because when you're not important, you actually suffer. And when you suffer, you mine power, which is adapt adaptability, right? Uh, and you out compete your opponents who did not believe in what you believed in, which was self-sacrifice. Uh, however, it turns out that the sun is not in an arbitrary location in the galaxy. If it was closer to Sagittarius A, there would be far too much mass, and then you would just burn up. Uh, there's too much mass swirling around and too much heat, therefore, just too much kinetic energy. And this is obvious if you think about it for a few seconds, but if you don't, you get misled by the aesthetic of randomness. And the aesthetic of randomness tells you you're just a random star. Um, and so there was a good reason why Galileo uh, did what he did. He was like, in a way, he was emulating Christ. What Galileo was doing is, we are not the center, therefore I'm a greater sacrifice. If we understand relativity, it doesn't even make a difference to say, is the earth going around the sun, or is some particular uh, reference frame from some photon in the sun moving in relation to some particular little crustacean in the sea? It's all relative reference frames. So, <laughs> Einstein allowed us to see the truth, which is that there is no time. There is no single global time. Time is a construction inside of the mind. And the mind itself, if we assume that it is physical, then as we do, right, we assume that everything is causally linked. So if we assume that it is physical, then mind itself and so all the processing required for the experience of time, I always use the example of, in order to illustrate this to all the people who believe in a sort of unitary brain object 
that has this physical aesthetic that exists outside of mind. Uh, in order to deconstruct that, what I uh, tend to use is the example of a simple shape. When you see a shape, it has both the shape and the color. These are inseparable. You are seeing something, right? But at the level of the brain, if you try to decompose that, the processing is distributed in the space-time. It, it has to be. Like, like it, it's not occurring in a single locus. There's no little place where it all comes together and converges into a point. Therefore, what this reveals is that there, there are no boundaries. Like, there are no arbitrary boundaries. The, the brain doesn't know, hey, I'm a brain. It's more like your experience is already a memory that's compiled from all possible existences. All possible existences become compiled into that particular experience. And the more you understand the brain and the more you sort of decompose it and deconstruct it, the more you can tweak it, the more you can tweak it because you're engaging in that reductionist process. However, you can never actually find your pieces. It's like this is the mistake, is to think you could eventually find, ah, yes, I could see from the outside, I am this neuron and this neuron firing here, and when this neuron fires in this particular way, then I am this, I become this. However, you can't see what you are, because by the time that you experience seeing, by the time you have an understanding, a perception, consciousness, this being, by the time you are something, you have already been compiled from eternity because there wasn't a time sweeping that forward. So, so this is, this explains memory and it, everything is memory is a point. Like your experience is already a memory and you could also say it's already a dream. So, so there's, there isn't a fundamental distinction between dreaming at night in REM sleep and being awake, except in so far as you are more in tune with, with what is rational. And that, that which is rational is what is guiding behavior. So, so that's the voluntary cross, because there's no reason to be rational. We could just be crazy mystical creatures. We could just imagine that we are nothing at all and just vanish away from this, and then we wouldn't be fashioning a diamond from the coal. You would just dissolve into that. You could just go and blow up your mind with psychedelics or go and blow up your mind with a shotgun and dissolve back into whatever other experience that has nothing to do with this rational sort of ascent towards that, whatever we are ascending to. Stanley Kubrick was a genius.